Hello guys! Welcome back to Not Just Mecha! It's Marco here, and today we paint the mighty Lionel Johnson with a classic heavy metal look, but without using the heavy metal process. With Adepticon and its golden demon coming in less than a month, I'm very much in the mental space of the retroengineering meta-analysis of what makes a heavy metal piece a quintessential heavy metal piece. But even understanding its visual tropes, having spent the last few months on super painterly display painting, I really cannot stand and physically accept its established practical process. So, even if I'm pretty sure I will not be able to finish a single one of my entries, you can follow this struggle live on Twitch. This is an exercise to align hands and muscle memory to these ideas, without losing my sanity or compromising too much my artistic beliefs. And I hear you say, but Marco, you selfish obsessive compulsive painter, what do I get from this? Well, you get a borderline speed painting process to obtain a synthesis of that iconic look with really a minimum amount of effort that will look great applied to your heroes and central models and that, hopefully, will fix uh, some of the bad habits coming from the GW tutorials. Is it a sub-assembly if you don't glue all the three models on the base from the beginning? If it is so, this is one of the very few sub-assemblies on this channel. Usually my rule is, uh, if you can see it, the brush can get there. Concept that works great for the flow and consistency of uh, lights and shadows, that's always my first and main concern. But with the sharpness needed by this style, I get the need of working on a few pieces by themselves every now and then. With the preparatory stuff done, I start climbing the chromatic and value scale with the zenithal, slightly frontal, dark blue-green general undertone. The idea is to set a cold feel for the shadows, and this deep uh, turquoise tone is great to get the chill vibes of blue, but preloaded with grain, and ready to gently move to the new slice of the color wheel. Ooh, and to cover all the comments, heavy metal doesn't use the airbrush. Well. I have a kid and a bunch of other stuff to do during the day. Oh, and I also have an airbrush, so I'm going to use it. Green needs uh, no explanations. The lion is a big dark angel, so even aiming for kind of a black armor, I want it as an extremely chromatic black, and green has to be the main theme and general midtone. The interesting bit is how it will work in different ways as a high-value midtone for the cape and a low-value midtone, almost a high-value shadow for the armor. Keep an eye on this. The warmer red parts need extra steps to arrive at their relatively warmer tones with the same proportionally slow movement and gentle increments. And I use the same colors also to base the non-metallic gold bits, that falling in the yellow spectrum naturally share a bunch of this climb because of their warm local tones and the common chase of a warm light source. So coming out from the blue-green, a deep purple is a natural choice. followed by a mid-value reddish-brown that represents the last bit of common ground. I suddenly jump to higher values on the gold bits with a rich orangey yellow ochre. I'm going to increase the value of the other materials with smaller increments, but here I want to quickly establish the high contrast nature of polished metal, and skipping mild intermediates helps to quickly create the illusion. Thank you. 
With a more uh, diffused and uh, solid application, this color is also great for the local tones of the lion pelt, the monastic white robes and parchment. Similar reasoning for this uh, light turquoise that's my gateway into the mid-tones of the cold, silverish, non-metallic metals. And uh, when the airbrush game becomes uh, too risky, I switch to the brush for just a couple of tiny, more complicated bits. Yeah, it happens. But here the confidence fully comes back, with the mid-tone for the red parts, that is simply a bright, vibrant, saturated red straight from its bottle. And here we officially enter into the realm of light, with the consolidation of the color of the silver non-metal. Not a crazy value jump here, but I wanted some subtle chromatic variations to suggest a bit of subtle greenish reflections. And high contrast localized lights for the armor. I use a vibrant light green to highlight the cape, that I spray with a slightly lower pressure to get a more dotty feel, that's great to layer the sensation of heavy, high-quality fabric. and a light skin tone for uh, a bunch of stuff. This uh, represents the tendency of uh, my higher mid-tones to converge into the warm, radiant, gold and hopeful environmental light that uh, wraps uh, the entire scene. So the presence of this hue on basically every part of the model shouldn't be a surprise. Of course, it is expressed with different proportions and extensions by different parts, based on their affinity with the temperature of their local tones. To put it simply, a warm tone like red will be easily dragged into warmer territories, because of its being chromatically close and super compatible, while blue, turquoise and green will make less dramatic steps, also accentuated by the fact that I'm applying less skin tone on them. But still, everything is moving into that general and cohesive warm environmental light. And of course, my final bling of the extreme values has to come from pure white. A bit because of its own visual properties, but mostly for the effect of the simultaneous contrast generated by this specific layering of colors. White looks cold and in opposition with the concept of the warm light. But again, white is the ultimate source of the ultimate high value. So I need it but I can easily fix its temperature in the next phase, while keeping it in its uh, pure form on the non-metallic parts. I know, this looks like a crappy mess, but my ugly phases always last a bit longer than the average, so stay with me. 
More or less, at this point, the GW flow suggests it's all wrapping, all swallowing, and all messing general monochromatic dark wash. But there are way better and equally quick ways to establish shadows. The trick is thinking of the shadows a bit more mindfully. I've already quickly climbed the value and chromatic scale with a specific set of tones. So, to enhance the shadows, there's almost uh, no reasoning about the colors left to do here, because uh, it's just about uh, going back, walking the same path in reverse. This flow that uh, takes advantage of the high transparency and saturation of inks, or GW contrast and uh, similar products if you prefer, takes in account more than a few technical parameters. First of all, even if uh, airbrush novices and or haters believe that the airbrush gives you automatic, super smooth transitions, well, it doesn't. Because uh, the atomization, for its own nature, has a dotty look and feel, and this uh, transparent glazing takes care of that, truly making the flow of paint uh, super smooth and continuous. Painting Ushoran in the last video, I used oil paints for a similar end result. Because uh, with its general organic nature, oils were able to give me a more organic feel, but inks uh, can perfectly cover the same role for something sharper and uh, hard-edged like a big armor. Transparency is the key, not really the medium or the tool used to obtain it. Second, GW tutorials always forget to tell you to compensate for the darkening effect of a wash. So the models come out of it super dark and dull. The dull effect mostly comes from the incompatibility of the tones overlapped, but that's a whole different color theory rabbit hole. You saw me pushing the lights to the extreme, because I know that by reworking and enhancing the shadows, whatever system or medium is used, everything naturally goes down. And I want to land in a balanced middle, ready for the brushwork on the extreme lights, not start again the whole climb, and basically the whole work. Third, sprayed colors are always less deep, rich and vibrant than a layer applied with a brush, because pigments set in a different way and with a different density, and the crazy saturation of inks fixes that just by existing. A mix of Dark Angel's Green and Basilicanum Grey sets the extreme darks of the armor, with a push on the pre-existing shadows and a subtle darkening filter over the whole progression. I know, no oil paint this time, but there are still more than a few panel lines that the airbrush blasted and swallowed in its natural lack of precision, and I'm never in the mood to re-establish them with traditional methods. So, coming directly from Gunpla modeling, I'm going to use enamels to do the work. Here, I'm aiming exclusively and in a super precise way for sharp recesses and panel lines with a pin washing attitude, and enamels, still moving by themselves with the capillarity push and low surface tension of the white spirit, tend to be less runny, more grubby, more stable, matte, and opaque than oils. So, when I need extreme sharpness with no collateral blends or gentle fading, enamels are my first choice. They also dry super quickly in these quantities, almost with acrylic timings. And there's no real cleaning like on Ushoran happening here, just maybe a tap with a pointy stiff brush to erase an imprecise touch here and there.
And to the brushwork, aka mostly edge highlights that are the main visual trope of this style. Impossible to skip, and for which there are no magic tricks. Ok, maybe one or two. This is uh, the part of the exercise with the less intensive thinking part and more intensive practical side, but I'm here precisely for that kind of stretching and sweet, sweet muscle memory. What is important to point out is that uh, all the work done before moving to the wet palette and uh, the finer brushwork happened in the span of a couple of hours, that's why I define this process as borderline speed painting. But this is not to brag about my being fast or to give any additional value or meaning to speed. Speed is never the goal, just a subproduct of knowing what you want to obtain and work efficiently in that direction. And I swear, I made no effort to try to be fast. From the beginning, that was never the point of this exercise. This is to say that all this rich, chromatic and volumetric part, still being the conceptual, theoretical and visual most important aspect of painting in general, is ironically pretty quick and easy to practically, physically set on the model. So, giving you so much for so little, doing it in the best and more conscious way possible should be a no-brainer choice. The work that we do from this point on sets the difference between being an en plein air impressionist painter or a photorealistic artist and everything in between. But the foundation is the same for every kind of painting that is not purely abstract. And to stretch this concept even more, your perception of the ugly face as messy is coming precisely from the lack of holding lines for the shapes of lights and shadows that flow into each other without the boundaries of definition. Like taking away the black borders from a comic, you remain with just colored shapes that quickly lose identity and meaning. And that is proved by the fact that as soon as I'm adding those lines, again, I'm not really touching most of the insides of the shapes, everything starts looking like something finished. From the practical point of view, the best and honestly game-changing tip is to move to higher density paints. The creamy, grubby consistency will find and catch edges and protruding details by itself, giving you also a ton of margin for corrections, because it's quite forgiving and playable, and it gives you a potential larger range of thicknesses for the line, simply changing a bit the pressure of the brushstrokes. Even chasing the heavy metal look, I cannot stand the sameness and lack of character of different materials, so I try to integrate clean and gentle textures, at least to create some difference between fabric and armor. GW always underuses beautifully sculpted capes.
interesting trick, I use a pure titanium white only at the end and only for the non-metallic bits. I don't let any other element reach pure white, so the fake metallic sheen can have an extra click of high value and a general contrast, able to sell its higher reflective nature and internal value extremes. And uh, here is uh, the final result of this exercise. The Lion has been at the very top of my priorities slash to-do list slash pile of shame. The borders between them are blurring away. For a while. And I'm pretty sure I want to paint another one with a stronger accent on storytelling to contrast and compare sharper technicality to a more visceral and contextualized render. By the way, there's no right or wrong, and you can totally have both. Competition display painting is traditionally precisely that, but is a reaction to the status quo and the crazy level of expansion and exploration that mini painting is having at the moment. I'm really enjoying riding the extremes, because the newer and most exciting stuff hides always in there. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment, you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials, or watch me painting live on Twitch. Check the schedule of the streams on the Twitch homepage. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community, or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys!